All right, so in a nutshell, what I have to say about bullying is that it stinks, and I think I can probably stop right there and go and sit back down because there's not much more that needs to be said about it in my opinion. But the reality is, I know it stinks, you know it stinks, everybody knows it stinks, and yet it's still happening, and we're still doing it. So there's a problem. We all know it's bad. And I think that part of the problem is a problem with the language, right? Because we tend to think of bullying, perhaps, as uh, Mr. Russell beating up on the little guy, right? Or cool girl picking on somebody that she considers to be a little less cool. And we don't think of it, so we think those are the bullies. And me, that's what I call the big B bullies, all right? But the reality is, when it comes to bullying, is that it's also everybody else. It's not just these guys. Everybody bullies. Everybody participates in this. The, the roots of it are in a song. And that could be whether, you know, you just happen to, you know, be kind of pissed off about something in your life or whatever. You treat people a little bit more pissy than somebody else might. Or, uh, you know, apathetic, kind of like, uh, whatever, I don't care, nobody cares about me, watch me care about me, watch me care about me, watch me yeah, whatever, right? And then that can actually translate into how you treat people, or, you know, you walk around with uh, resentment, like, uh, more like, and so crummy to me, I'm just kind of not giving a crap about anybody or anything, you end up treating people wrong, or you end up distrusting people, I've been betrayed, I mean, whatever, and I'm going to go around, and I'm not going to trust you, and I'm going to treat you kind of nasty, or maybe you're just downright, you know, curious towards everyone, everything you like, and you just treat people, you're yelling people, you know, Mr. Yelly, or whatever. And all of these participate in the cycle of treating people unkindly, at the very least, cruelly, at the very worst. But to me, these are all forms of bullying, the way that we treat each other. And we might think, oh yeah, but me, based on my experiences, you know, I've got the right to be resentful because of what I've experienced. Or, yeah, you know, I've got the right to yell to you because I'm really, really mad right now, kind of thing. And you know what, yeah, well maybe there are reasons that we have these reactions to the experiences that we've had. But you think it's just me, but in reality, it's everybody. And then everybody's treating everybody like that. And everybody's, at the very least, unkind to others, and at the very worst, downright cruel. And I think unkindness is a form of cruelty. So, uh, in my opinion, we need to deal with this. We need to get, we need to take a really close look at what's actually going on in ourselves, primarily, in others as well. And I think that understanding what's going on and why, what's actually happening, I think that understanding is the best weapon and the best defense against anything. So, that's my strategy. And bullying, you might not think so, but there's an equation to it. It's as much a mathematical equation as gravity. There is an x plus y plus z that equals bullying. And this is as mathematical as it's going to get, so don't you worry. Um, so, first, we have the bully, right? In order to have bullying, you have to have a bully. Second, in order to have bullying, there needs to be a victim, or many victims, or whatever, or many bullies, or whatever. But without a victim, there's no bullying, without a bully, there's no bullying. And finally, this formula is not complete without witnesses. A witness, many witnesses. And you, I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but a bully needs a witness. And that witness could be a crowd of people, it could be their buddy who goes to the mall, it could even be the, the victim 
could be the witness. If the victim is unconscious and passed out, the bully's probably not going to continue, right? Because there's if but if the bully's conscious, if the victim is conscious that the bully is exercising power over me, then the bully Right, we're going to go in more into the dynamic of what's actually going on. But if there's nobody to witness an act of bullying, then there really is no point to doing it. And the witness might be somebody that the bully tells about afterwards, or whatever it happens to be. But a bully that acts only in secret, in my mind, would just be insane. Just sadistic. Right? Something else is going on here. And we'll go into this a little bit more, but we do need these three elements to bullying. And as I said, the witness could even be the victim themselves. Maybe the only ones that ever know about it would be the bully and the victim. But these are needed. And the witness, right, it could be, it doesn't just have to be somebody who thinks that the bully is cool. That's not all that the bully feeds off of. Reactions could, you know, from laughing to laugh, I mean, that scares me, I'm really scared, you know, that's a big scary bully to enjoy it, getting a little bit of, you know, sadistic pleasure out of what's going on, to being concerned, or I don't care, or just, you know, shocked, whatever. All of these are reactions to bullying, the bully gets off on, all right? So it doesn't really matter what kind of reaction the witness is having. We'll go more into that later. But I also want to point out, before I go further, in the introduction, it was mentioned that, you know, I mean, the words were an inspiration to, to victims of bullying. And um, that's very generous. I appreciate being called an inspiration. I, I don't consider myself all that inspiring at all. But it's not just, it is actually two victims of bullying. But what I want to point out and be very clear on is that I don't, it's not just this guy here that I consider to be a victim of bullying. I consider everybody involved in this equation to be a victim of bullying. Everybody's life is made worse by bullying, including and almost especially the bully's life. A bully, a big B bully, has a much higher than average rate of incarceration as an adult and of multiple incarcerations. And not just that, but we're going to go into issues like self esteem. If you go around stomping on people, if you go around treating people like that, you don't end up feeling very good about yourself. Your self-esteem isn't worth much at all. If because you can only hide so so long from the reality, the recognition of what it is you're doing, and how what kind of relationship you have with other people. Life is a relationship. And if you've only got lots of relationships with people, you're not going to do well. And also victims, obviously, I don't need to explain why it is that a victim of bullying is a victim of bullying. It can destroy lives, and it can last a lifetime. I mentioned that 68-year-old woman who's just come to a point of healing at 65. So she's had three years of feeling that she recovered from her life's experiences. And then the witnesses of bullying. Their lives are impacted long term, believe it or not. There was recently a CBC radio show about bullying, and they had victims of bullying call in to talk about their experiences as adults, talking about the experiences they had when they were younger. They had bullies call in, talking about their experiences of having bullied people and how that has impacted their life in the long term, negatively always. And then we had people calling in who had witnessed bullying at some point in their life. And who were saying that to this day as adults, that they, they still uh, have regret at having watched what happened and done nothing. They live with regret and guilt as adults. And it has impacted them severely, right? So everybody, in my mind, is a victim of bullying. Let's begin, though, with the bully. All right. I hope you appreciate my artwork. It is all 100% original. So I want to point out that the bully in, uh, is not just this Mr. Muscle guy, but it's also a right, cool girl. And it's also everybody else. And I also want to point out that 
we, we all know, of course, of bullying. I'm sure that there's nobody here who's, what, what's bullying? I, I've never heard of that before, right? We all kind of know, right? But in a nutshell, bullying, there is physical bullying, the beating up of other people, or the threat of beating up of other people, or, you know, just looking like this big scary guy, so I'm going to go around as if I could beat up people around me, and intimidate, and one way or another to physically dominate others. And there's psychological bullying, which is words instead of punches, right? And psychological rather than physical domination to emotionally exploit or manipulate somebody, or to psychologically break somebody down. And this comes in all forms. I think that this is the one that most people are particularly guilty of. So, and I, I, I really want to emphasize that I think that to some degree or another, we have all had either the desire or we have actually psychologically or physically dominated somebody else. I think we've all being physically or psychologically dominated by someone as well. So everybody in this room is all on the same page, I think, in my opinion. And personally, you know, I I could say I've been that guy. I've definitely been that guy. I don't think I've been that guy. But I I've, I've been these I've been these guys too, right? And one of my experiences, I, I've never been a big mean bully, right? This is not me. I, I can't. I have a very hard time treating people on hiding. But one of the ways that I have bullied when I think back on it in my life was in high school. I was, I, I was raised in a private Christian school. There was this girl in my class. I'd lent her my Bible, which for me at the time was my most precious possession. And when she returned it to me, this is also silly, but when she returned it to me, she had spilled liquid paper all over it. And this is like, oh, this is my Bible, and she highlighted and underlined things. Anyways, I ended up treating the Bible with a great deal more respect than I ended up treating her. I was, I was pretty angry with her, and I let her know about it. But where I crossed the border from just being angry and messed up my thing here, she was a bit of a nerd. And I got angry with her. I treated her more unkindly than I actually felt towards her. Because she, of all people, had done that to me. Right? And I looked down at I looked down at her like that. And it was it, it lasted three minutes. And then I go off and then I felt like crap and I go back and I apologize. <laughs> and all was right again. But it can happen like that. Her sense of inferiority, she accepted it. Me talking to her like that. My sense of superiority and a dash of anger burst the bully in me. She paid very close attention. And what, that, what I was doing, in that very subtle form of bullying, was I was saying, I am superior to you. You are inferior. And I'm going to make this little show of it. I'm going to make sure you know that I am cooler than you. That I'm better than you, and that you can't do that kind of thing to me, mess up my body. <laughs> but it was a showing off, a demonstration of my superiority over her. And that is what bullying is it's a show, it's an act, it's a demonstration, a physical or a verbal demonstration of my superiority over you. Right? So this raises the question, why do we show off? If you can't tell, this is a peacock, this is a gorilla beating his chest, and this is Mr. Russell, the bully. Why do we show off? Did you ever ask yourself this question, right? I think probably, as animals, first, that and we are animals. I'm sorry if I'm the one who has to break this to you. But we are very much animals. Ooh. And as animals, hierarchy, I think, is, is probably built into our genes. Right? The instinct 
to eliminate threat by establishing dominance. We gain a sense of security by being dominant, right? And the whole survival of the fittest, etc. And in that regard, the bully is not unlike an alpha hyena, as I, to me, this, I picture this laugh, this strong laughing man, you know? And the, and the bully acts very much the same. And just on a side note here, I've got to point out that the alpha hyena, I looked this up, is always a female, right? The, the one who leads the pack, who dominates all the others, is a female. And it's the female with the highest levels of testosterone. So what can we learn from this? One, that females can be bullies. They can be bad, dominant bullies. And also that testosterone, I think, probably has an effect too on, on uh, aggression, which we, we all know it does. Those are just side notes. But, as thinking beings, right, who generally consider ourselves to have evolved beyond the hyena, beyond the instinct to divide weak from strong, why do we compete? Hmm? Why show off strength? If not to say, please think I'm cool, uh, I'm strong, right? And why try to act cool, if not to say, please think I'm cool, right? Why make you feel stupid, except to say, please think that I'm smart, Ooh, right? And where does this all come from? This desire for recognition or approval or admiration, right? But to me it's one of fear. The fear that I'm not strong, the fear that I'm not cool, the fear that I'm not smart. If you think I'm strong, then I must be. If you think I'm cool, then I must be. If you think I'm smart, then I must be. These are insecurities. They all come from the same place, which is fear. And whether you believe it or not, fear is revealed in the act of bullying. The worst bully is the most afraid. Have you ever seen a dog attack someone? Right? If you have, you must have seen the fear <coughs> And not just the fear of the dog, and the fear of the person being attacked, but also the fear in the dog. Right? A dog that attacks you is a dog that's afraid of you. The worst behavior comes from animals, including humans, who are afraid. A bully who shows off strength feels weak. And by bullying, proves it. Violence, whether physical or psychological, is an act of powerlessness. It reveals that I can think of no better way to get what I want. It's the crudest form of action, and ultimately the weakest form of influence. I'm going to give a little example here. I don't know if you can tell. We're going to talk about power very briefly. You can tell who this is. This is Hitler, right? Artistically captured. This guy, this little guy, I don't know if you recognize him, but this is Gandhi. I'm just, I'm just curious. Do people here know who Gandhi was? Yeah. Okay. You never know. If you don't know, don't be embarrassed, but if you don't know who Gandhi was, find out, it is worth knowing. So, Hitler, does anyone know who Hitler was? Thank you. Alright. So, Hitler brought millions of people to war through violence. And he controlled millions 
church ship. Gandhi brought millions to peace by fasting. And he had the hearts of everyone. Well, Hitler had the hearts of no one and the trust of no one. And what do you think would happen with all of these little guys if one day it doesn't work to their advantage to do what he wants? Do you think that they'll be faithful? Do you think that they'll be loyal? Okay. This little guy here, this guy who wanted all the control of the world, in reality had none. This guy who wanted no control whatsoever had total control. And this was in a country where there was no media. Well, there were maybe some, but the majority of the country was illiterate. This is in the early 20th century. No way to spread words other than word of mouth, primarily. And it spread across the entire country, millions upon millions upon millions of people in India. If there was violence, he said, I am not going to eat until all of the violence in the country ends. This is absurd. It seems ridiculous, right? You think this guy's just going to die then. But word spread so fast that he's not eating until we all stop our violence. And it worked. And everybody stopped their violence. Why? Because they loved him. That was the only power that he had. And it was ten, a hundred times the power that that guy had. So power through fear versus power through love there is no comparison. And so those who choose fear as the source of their power are those who feel most powerless to accomplish it any other way. Bullies are the weakest among us. And we all have this weakness. It's not just those bullies, those people. We all have this weakness. Right? Pay very close attention in yourself. But with a big B bully, it's an addiction, right? And it's never enough. Bullying can be, can be compared to a drug, and I actually think it is a form of drug, right? I bully someone, and I get a quick fix of feeling stronger, smarter, or cooler, right? It's artificial, but it feels like a real thing. And then I want it to another fix, so I do it again, and then have it for us. And then there you have your bully, a person addicted to belittling others. And like a drug, this acts as an escape, so that I don't have to pay any attention to what's actually going on in myself, which is that I hate myself. I hate my life. Whatever is going on, you act like that, you're not having to pay attention to that. Right? And, as with the drug, the bully is unaware of how transparent that kind of under the influence behavior looks to everybody else. Right? That guy's messed up. It's obvious. The bully thinks. Nobody's on. Nobody's on to me. So I want to use a quote here from one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain. Do you know who Mark Twain was? Yes. Yeah, well, he's good. I like him a lot. This is his self-portrait. So I, I, I'm using it to point out that I'm a much better artist than, than, he, than he was. And this was his self-portrait here. And actually, I don't. He says, I cannot make a good mouth, therefore leave it out. There's enough without the mouth anyways. <laughs> he wrote that in there. Anyway, the quote from Mark Twain was, um, oh, I just got a blank all of a sudden. Okay, um, yeah, um, gee, it's just a total blank. Um, Yes, thank you. I love you. Where do you work? <laughs> Better to remain silent and be thoughtful 
then to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Right? And this is true of words, and is equally true of actions. Right? I might feel insecure and afraid and angry and this and that, but unless I go around stomping on people, nobody would know it. Think about what your words and actions reveal. Don't be so quick to reveal your insecurities. And that's one of the things that's so sad, so silly and so tragic about the whole bullying phenomenon is that this is a problem of self-sabotage. In my experience, the bully is usually actually smart, actually strong, probably cool to whatever, but not that that matters. But it, it, the whole problem with the bully is that the bully doesn't believe him. Somewhere along the line, through whatever unfortunate circumstances, the bully has been made to feel weak, or powerless, or afraid. Right? And they've internalized that, they've taken that message, and it's self-sabotage. Because if the bully had a healthy and accurate and unmeddled with sense of self-worth, then there would be no problem. You don't demonstrate intelligence by going around and treating other people like idiots. Right? You don't demonstrate strength by using it to harm others. And acting cool, trying to act cool, isn't cool. Right? This is the logic that comes out of fear. That's the logic of fear. Those behaviors are the behaviors of fear. So bullies, if you're so strong, then prove it. Genuinely. Picking on the weak proves nothing but weakness. What is strength for, if not to protect? That's its function. That's organisms. That's why it's there. It's essential to survival. So bullying is fundamentally a perversion. It uses strength for exactly the opposite, unnatural purpose of harming myself and others. Do you see that? A bully is a malfunctional organism. And for bullies who psychologically devastate their victims, if you're so clever, then prove it, right? Genuinely. Crippling the already frail just makes a fool out of you, right? What is intelligence for if not for problem solving, right? That's its function, as organisms, that's why it's there to identify problems potential and real, and to find solutions. So again, this form of bullying is a perversion. It uses intelligence for exactly the opposite, unnatural purpose of creating problems where there would otherwise be none. So if you're bullying, then stop it. You can do better than that. Now let's look back again here. Back to the equation. Next to be the victim. I'm going to take a little look at that. And just a reminder here, the victim here is not just this guy lying on the floor of her. There's the, phys the victims of the physical bullying, physical harm, and then there's the victims of psychological harm, and then there's the bullies themselves who are victimized by their own behavior and their own messages towards itself. And then, of course, there's everybody else. Right? Witnesses, or people who just treat people like bullies, just the more subtle bullying in the day to day. All victims. And the experience of being a victim, of bullying, 
is the experience of powerlessness. Right? The experience of being phys physically or psychologically dominated. To have your power, your control taken away from you by somebody with the intent of causing you harm. So, what makes a victim? What makes it possible for me to be abused in that way? And I want to be very, very clear here that this isn't to suggest that the victim is to blame for anything. The blame goes to the bully or to whoever chooses to do violence. But with that said, what makes it possible to be abused by somebody else in that way, to be dominated physically or psychologically? We looked at the bully and we saw, I hope we all saw, the fear that's at the root of the behavior of stopping up people, right? The insecurities at the root there. So what what is it that makes a victim? Fear. It's the same thing. Right? I, would, I fear you. I, there's cases, there's a, a physical fear. I fear you, you'll beat me up, like, you know, whatever. And there's psychological fear. I fear you'll know, identify my weakness or my insecurity or something that I'm embarrassed about and expose it or exploit it. Physical fears, psychological fears, mean that I don't resist. Right? I'm afraid of you, and so I don't resist, I submit. And fear is the bully's power. Bullying is domination. And domination is only possible through the manipulation of fear. Having insecurity around bullies is like Superman having kryptonite to his enemies, right? It's like, here's my weakness. When I'm worn on my sleeve, you can see it's there. The bully, the bully is very familiar with fears and insecurities. They're, they're, they're deeper than the bully. So they're very good at sniffing it out of others, and they're always on the platform, right? So having fear or insecurity around a bully makes a target. The bully will sniff you out. And remember that an animal won't attack another animal that it thinks it can't beat, right? And it's the same with humans. So the bully is always sending out an insecurity that it can exploit. Right. So if we were to take a look here, play a little game that's called Pick the Victim. In this lineup here, who do you think is most likely to be targeted? Right. I mean, the ones that stand out usually are the ones that are most likely to attract the bully. And it's funny, I mean, I don't know whether it's, you know, a little bit of a DO maybe, or, you know, super tall or super short, or, you know. But the, the, the thing about this is that it's not just, when I drew this picture, I thought, oh, well, obviously, you know, which one's kind of obvious who's going to probably get it from the bully. But the thing is, it's not just those guys that stand out. The reality of bullying is that it's every single one of these that will have experienced some form of bullying, right? And in fact, when I think about it, this guy here, I think, well, after I hear about it, you're like, you know what, he's probably actually going to be okay. Because this guy doesn't look insecure whatsoever. This guy looks pretty darn content. So even if things were going on, he's probably pretty oblivious to it. So he's probably going to be okay. And, so it isn't any one specific quality that the bully targets, right? It could be your hygiene, it could be your, it could be sits, it could be your size, it could be your shape, it could be the clothes you wear, 
It isn't any specific quality that attracts the bully. I should know, because I've worn some of the worst clothes in history, and I totally got away with it. Okay? It's fear and security that attracts the bully. So, where there is no fear and no insecurity, the bully is powerless. I wonder if you, you really see the truth of that. It's funny, when I was preparing to come here and met with the, the great girls who were helping to organize this day, and I asked them if they'd ever experienced bullying. And they actually, I was surprised. I think they all pretty much said, actually, yeah, I, I, I've experienced being, being a victim of a bully. And I asked, you know, when was that and how was that? And they, one of them said, well, you know, it was really bad, you know, back when I was grade 9, blah, blah, blah. And when I actually cared about what people thought about me and this and that, but now, when I'm in grade 12, I just don't care. So, no more bullying. She just doesn't, doesn't care anymore what people think or what they say or whatever it happens to be. And here I am thinking, that's your answer. That's it. I don't care. And every time I go to a talk, I wear the shirt every time I go to a talk somewhere. And every, almost every time I get the question, you know, what's with the t-shirt, you know? And I think actually a lot of people really don't like it. And then here, there's a great 12 student here who's got the answer to bullying. I don't care what people think, what people say. It doesn't sink in. Right? I, and that is immunity. It is immunity to more than just bullies in life, trust me. So I defend this shirt. Stand by it. I'll tell you another story about insecurity. Okay, and I probably should have mentioned this actually before I tell the story. I haven't mentioned that I was I was I used to be a girl. I don't know if you know that about me. If you don't, surprise. Well, I was born. <laughs> my name is Caitlin. I was born a girl, raised a girl, and I transitioned. I'm a transsexual. So, uh, but one of the things about being a girl is that you got you know a big butt and you got a, a lot of a lot of things that I no longer But I had a big butt growing up, and I hated it. I, it was like to me, it's, it's again it's just a silly, silly. Whatever is a little insecurity you have physically about your body. Mine is my butt. There's a big yellow butt that I had. I walked around like, oh, and I didn't want people to tease me about it. I had a skirt for my school uniform. And because I thought like a guy, you know, I always wear my gym shorts under my skirts and I wouldn't have to change and be super quick. And, you know, at first in line and all these things like that, I had no thought to what it looks like to have thick shorts under your skirt, which is going to be problem worse. And sure enough, one day, a group of kids, this was a grade six, I think, a group of kids came out and started teasing me about my butt, you know, like, hey, you've got a big butt, kind of thing, right? And I, I was more than I should have, I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. But I thought, you know what? If, if I don't show that I'm embarrassed about this, then they won't know that I'm embarrassed about this. And just that moment of clarity. And so I, 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 I came back with something like, well, these days, isn't it a good thing for a girl to have a big butt? Yeah. And they're all like, oh, actually, yeah, okay, you know, people like big butts. <laughs> so, and I learned a valuable lesson in the vulnerability of insecurity and the power of confidence. Right? And I never heard a word about it again. It was very interesting. And by comparison, when I was in kindergarten, it was in kindergarten that I first said to anybody that I felt like a boy. And it was in line, I was telling my best friend James, you know, oh, I, I wish I was a boy, I don't, I don't like being a girl, I feel like a boy, you know. And then everybody overheard it and then everybody teased and just whatever. The reaction to that kind of thing was like, whoa. And so I vowed right then and there, I will never speak a word about this again. I broke that vow, you know, 20 years later. But it was that strong, a sense, oh, my goodness, this is something to be afraid of, this is something to hide, this is something to not talk about. They, their reaction to me ended up having a long-term impact on my life. I can't speak about this, I'm ashamed. I feel ashamed. So it worked. Because I had those fears, their reaction impacted me. And then the butt story, I decided to... The fears don't mean anything. Set them aside and react intelligently to the situation. And I was immune. Right? And it didn't impact me whatsoever. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but just to illustrate different ways to react. 
and the kinds of impacts that it will end up having on you, depending on how you react to the situations that you will find yourself in. Everybody's going to experience this stuff if you haven't already. But that, there are many treatments for bullying. But that is the cure, right? Without fear and without insecurity, you cannot be a victim of big B bullying. You could be beat up, you could be killed even, you could be teased, we all get our fair share and more. But without fear and without insecurity, you cannot be big be bullied. There is nothing to exploit. It's like Gandhi said, I'm gonna add him to the lineup. This little, little guy, he was a tiny, tiny guy. And he said, you can't hurt me without my permission. That is radical freedom. This little guy who got beat up, who got in prison over and over again, who got treated like a second-class citizen. And he's saying, you can't hurt me unless I allow myself to be hurt. It's very interesting. And when he said something, he meant it. So think about it. If your security, if your psychological security is totally independent, right? If your sense of self, your sense of your own worth is unimaginable, right? then your happiness and your well-being depend on nobody but you. So screw fear, pardon my language if that offends, but screw it, screw fear, screw insecurity. Love yourself. You know? So what if you're tall or short, or fat, or strong? And so what if you have a big butt, or if you're transsexual, or if you're gay, or if you're bisexual, or if you're asexual, right? Who cares? I don't, I don't care. Experiment with loving yourself, and you will find that it makes you immune to the effects of bullying. And it's the same cure for bullies. Screw fear, screw insecurity, love yourself and everybody else. That is where you will find your unmeddled with sense of self-worth, and that's where you'll find the you that is not cruel. If you're being bullied, then take control. Take your control back. Do whatever it takes. If you've got to tell a teacher, tell a principal, tell your friends, tell your parents, tell the janitor, tell the police, tell the reporter, I don't care. Just be a tattletale. There are worse things. People will say, oh, don't tattletale, whatever. If somebody is harming you psychologically, physically, and not just Remember, it's not just the big bully that beats up somebody. It can be your, it could be a parent. It could be a sibling. It could be your best friend. If you are being psychologically or physically manipulated, dominated, or harmed, then you have the right to say no. I don't deserve this, and I will do what it takes. If somebody came up and punched me, I'd be off filing an assault charge. Right? To think that there are people who would accept this as just everyday life it is so disturbing to me. Do you think that that's what you deserve? Right? No. You deserve dignity. You deserve love. You deserve nurturing. You are good. You are precious. And you are powerful. Don't let anybody break through. Don't let anybody sabotage your self-worth. This Gandhi guy here, right, this one little tiny little man. I don't know if you are familiar with the whole story, but India used to be owned by the British, and the British were the world power. They owned half the world. I think actually, literally, including India. So this guy is surrounded by all the soldiers and all of the flags and all of everything, the entire British Empire. And he says, no, you, this isn't your home, this is our home, you need to go now. 
And long story short, he won. And this is a guy who would never lift a finger. I will not be violent. And I will not respond to your violence with more violence. All we had was truth and love. And he defeated the entire British Empire. They left the eventual country after much ugliness. But they had to suffer blows. They had to suffer violence. And it worked. Very interesting. So, experiment with that. And I think that you'll find that a strong sense of self is as good as a bulletproof vest when it comes to abuse. Back to the equation here. Finally, the witness. Now, who are the witnesses, right? It's not just the people who friends, uh, bullies, uh, buddies who go to mom or whatever it happens to be. It's also the victim. The victim can be the witness to the bully that the bully feeds off of. The, the, witness, the victim's reaction. It could be another bully who witnesses and you're showing off for them. Or it could be everybody else. Again, everybody's a witness. Now, but this, see, back here, you know, well, I'm just, uh, I'm angry, so I'm not going to do anything because of this, or, you know, I'm, I'm scared, so I'm not going to react. And, this, and uh, everybody's got a, re a reason why they don't respond to, to bullying when they witness it. But the, the victim doesn't care. This is, how, this is how witnesses look to the victim. Just faceless, nameless, crowd of people who don't get a crap. Right? And whether you like it or not, this is actually much closer to reality than the whole, oh, well, I would react, but I'm scared. Right? So what is it? Do you, do you think that being a witness to bullying leaves you innocent of a crime? Right? Standing by and watching somebody get me up, is that innocent? Or laughing when somebody gets teased? Is that innocent? Right? Bullying is a show. And the witness is the one that the show is for. Whether you like it or not, you are involved. And you are more powerful than the bully. Because the bully wants something from you. Your admiration your fear, your laughter, your respect, your submission. The bully wants these from you. And when I want something from you, you are in a position of power. That's how it works. So wanting that is the bully's weakness. And you, as the witness, have the power to refuse to give your respect, your laughter, your submission, your fear. Right? You have that power, so use it. There are always ways of reacting as witnesses to bullying. And they, none of them has any impact on what's actually going on. And in fact, the bully likes all of these reactions. And it defeats the bully. You're afraid of me, I feel powerful. You, you're laughing, I feel cool. Right? I feel fine, I feel whatever. To me, the healthiest, the only reaction that doesn't feed into this is the healthiest reaction to bullying, which is appalled. I am appalled. Just I call this guy appalled guy. Okay? I don't know if you know what the word called means. Appalled means literally the draining, pale, becoming pale, the draining of the blood from the face. This is a shock reaction. I can't believe you're doing that. I'm shocked, I'm appalled, and being appalled, you react. Okay? And that throws the bully off, because this is an honest reaction, and you're seeing it for what it is. And you're seeing it makes others see it, makes the bully see it. Right? But the reality is, that, well, I mean, I, how much time do I have? 
I don't agree. <laughs> I gotta tell a story. Uh, and, you know, elementary school, these two guys were fighting, punches and everything like that, and I, I was so shocked. I jumped in between them. I remember I was a girl at the time. I jumped in between them because I was just appalled. I was shocked that I was appalled. This has to stop, stop. I jumped between them and I got punched in the face, right? But, and so it wasn't, it wasn't the brightest thing to do, it was a very stupid thing to do. But it stopped. It ended right there. Everyone was just shocked at, that, at what had happened. And shocked that then it became about a guy having the edge girl too, right? So he got even more trouble. But one of the an ironic kind of outcome of that whole thing was that one of the guys who was fighting, I don't even know what they're fighting about. And he ended up with a crush on me for years afterwards. It was very I felt so bad because like I'm not I got a wife, I'm very hetero, not I don't like guys that much. I like guys, but I'm not talking guys. Uh, so I felt really bad for that. It was years, years. And so it was interesting that, that it, it's not, I know from experience, it's not violence that inspires respect and submission and admiration from others. It's the non-tolerance of violence that inspires respect, admiration, and submission, whether you want it or not. I didn't want it. Right? It's very interesting. Not tolerating violence. It's so bullying, that's one of the reasons that it bugs me so much, is that bullying isn't only bad, it's stupid. Right? Everything that the bully wants is gained ironically by doing exactly the opposite of bullying, right? So it's not only bad, it's stupid. It's the opposite of intelligent behavior. It's the means to the opposite of the end that I want. So, but the reality here, back to the witness, the Paul guy, the reality is 85% of bullying stops within 10 seconds of peer intervention. But the reality is, that the majority of witnesses don't intervene. Why? Fear. I mean, same thing. Fear and fear and fear. So, if you were to take a look here at what I call the tree of fear, do you, I wonder if you see it. That it's not all the same root, fear, and if you're a dominant, aggressive person, you're going to, it'll manifest, fear will manifest itself as a bully. If you are a submissive, type naturally by nature, then the fear will manifest itself probably as being a victim of bullying. And if you're somewhere anywhere in between, you're going to be the witnesses who just kind of treat people kind of nasty, you don't care whatever it happens to be. And that's the middle people, it'll become that. That's how fear manifests itself. So where does a Paul guy fit into this? A Paul guy comes in with a jeans on to cut the whole thing down because that tree is wrong. <laughs> Completely wrong. I'm glad they like that. So, but it, it, it's more than that, right? So we see the fear. When it comes to witnesses, though, that most witnesses don't interfere because they're afraid I'll become the next target. They might end up in the toilet, whatever happens to be. But it's more than that because when I have seen cruelty, when I have witnessed it, I don't have time to think logically enough to fear. I react. Right? Act now, regret later. Right? What makes it possible to witness cruelty and to remain unmoved by it? Right? It's apathy. Why the apathy? Your problem isn't my problem. And in fact, if I get a laugh at your problem, all the better. Right? So, back to that crowd of observers and how very accurate to me those faceless faces are, because this is apathy. But what happens? See what happens to a crowd when one steps out and objects. I'm telling you, it can change everything. One appalled person in the crowd can make all the difference. So be appalled. And what happens down the road if one day everybody reacts in a healthy way to seeing people cruelly treated? I call this the army of the appalled. The bully's not getting anywhere near that. So everybody has a role to play in bullying, right? Without any one of these pieces, bullying doesn't happen. If the bully, right, bullies, you can stop it. That's it. You can do better than that. And then there's no bullying. The equation's thrown off. Victims, you can be independently well. 
You can take control, and if you can't control your circumstances, then take control of your ability to be independent and well. Don't let anybody break through. And then there is no bullying. It can't be done. Witnesses, be appalled. Butt in, intervene, react to what you see and hear. So there's all kinds of things you can do, but what you need to do is just react, and you'll think of something. Even the dumbest idea is enough to put a stop to cruel, senseless behavior. So my conclusion, screw fear, screw apathy, be appalled, butt in, love yourself, love others, live confidently, act intelligently, be happy, be independent, be well, and finally, be good. Because frankly, the alternative sinks.